Formula One on Five Live. Las Vegas as we're gearing up for the third and final practice session of the Las Vegas Grand Prix weekend. It's Rosanna Tennant with you down in the pit lane and I'm standing outside the Red Bull garage where the music is pumping. Local time, it's nearly half past eight in the evening. So the sun set several hours ago and the city has now been illuminating. The iconic landmarks lit up, the Bellagio, you've got Caesar's Palace and of course the Sphere as well, all circulating and, and around this brand new street circuit that the teams and drivers are getting to know. And this evening we're hoping for a little bit more of normal, in inverted commas, running because yesterday, if you were with us, you'll know we only managed eight or nine minutes of the first practice session before it was stopped and not resumed after Esteban Ocon in the Alpine and Carlos Sainz in the Ferrari sustained such bad damage from a water cover, a uh, water drain cover that had popped up uh, and broke their cars. So the session was suspended, not resumed, and then we had to wait several hours for the second practice session to get underway. That finally started at 2.30 in the morning here in Las Vegas and ran for 90 minutes. So a little bit of extra track time for the teams and drivers which then meant they had plenty of data to go on overnight and I'm sure people were here until the early hours of the morning morning pouring over that data so that they're in a better position going into FP3 and of course qualifying later on as well. So I'm down here in the pit lane it's fairly mild 17 degrees and we were promised much colder temperatures coming out to Las Vegas so we've all got our, our big puffer jackets on but actually not that needed as things stand and as I'm looking out across the start finish straight there are fans in the grandstand they were sent home before fp2 yesterday so they are back and ready to enjoy all that formula one has to offer as the cars will take to this amazing new circuit uh, and hopefully wow some new fans uh, into becoming serious passionate fans of this sport and in the commentary box we have former formula one driver jolian palmer racing driver alice powell and the bbc's chief f1 writer andrew benson jolian yesterday was a weird one have you recovered and are you ready to see the cars out on this track once again for hopefully some some more normal running as i say yeah i, I was gonna say a new day has dawned but we actually <laughs> lived through that didn't we last night at the start of fp2 it's uh, it feels like a new day though and uh, we're getting ready for a conventional run of fp3 and qualifying later on hopefully one hour for each and Hopefully, the, the track will behave itself now. We've, uh, we've learned everything. Well, hopefully, the FIA have learned everything that went wrong yesterday. They've had time to fix it. And we can crack on with the race. And that's what I'm looking forward to today. Oh, good. I'm glad you're in good spirits because this is a, a, a weird and wonderful place. I have to say, Las Vegas, something very new for all of us on the team, uh, getting to grips with how this city works. And of course, when Formula One rolls into town, everything changes. Alice, this circuit, as Jolian said, you know, we hope it behaves itself this evening. No more water valve covers popping up and out of the, the track. Um, such an interesting circuit, 6.2 kilometers. Looks fairly simplistic on first glance, but from what you saw yesterday, does it present enough challenges for these 20 best drivers in the world? I think it does. You know, I certainly can't remember and definitely can't fit all, all of them on my two hands and my feet. The amount of times that people were locking up going into turn 12 yesterday, a real tricky corner as you come through turn 11. And it's so difficult to try and get the car straight for, for braking going into to turn 12. So we had numerous drivers shoot down the escape road. Max Verstappen was certainly one of those having to spin his car around to, to get back out. And then down the very long straight into 14 as well. We saw a few errors there. And even into turn one, several drivers losing the rear, going wide there. And then that's your lap really ruined effectively in that first sector and for, for the remainder of the lap. So it's certainly challenging. And I wonder with these lower temperatures, OK, at the moment, it's it's not too bad. Air temperature is 17, track temperature is, is 19 degrees. It's not too cold. But when we have our qualifying later on, at midnight uh, local time those track temperatures will certainly be lower and it's it's proving a little bit tough for some drivers to, to, to try and generate that tire temperature and also with these long straights that gives the the tire chance to to cool to cool down so trying to maintain that tire temperature can be really tricky so so certainly we've uh, we've seen several drivers go off uh, they have avoided the walls for now at least 
Yeah, the drivers are getting ready. I'm just standing outside the Mercedes garage. Lewis Hamilton and George Russell saying they had a lot of fun out there. So I think the drivers are enjoying the challenge and you can hear the cheering. The fans are enjoying what they're seeing, getting ready for this third and final practice session. Not too long to wait now before they'll be heading out. We've got a green light at the end of the pit lane. Hopefully we can draw a line under everything we saw yesterday. And hopefully, as you say, Jolien, the track will behave itself. Uh, no one rushing out just yet, though. In FP1 yesterday, although we only had eight or nine minutes of it, people were rushing out. They wanted to get that data. Were you expecting them to be straight out at the end of the pit lane uh, a little sooner, Jolien? Well, there was actually plenty of running in the end yesterday, up to 40 laps, just over 40 laps for, uh, for some of the drivers out there. 42 the most of anyone for Hamilton, Albon and Sargent. So they now feel like they know this place fairly well, I think. And there's no rush to go out and burn through a set of tyres whilst the track is not in a great condition. Daniel Ricciardo is just waiting, sitting with his uh, engineers on the pit wall. Beanie hat on. He's obviously feeling the, the nip of the Vegas cold air in the desert. But yeah, I'm still sat in this commentary box with my, my big puffer jacket on. So uh, trying to keep warm. But a few drivers now looking to, to get in the car. Alex Albon, uh, his very funky, it must be said, Las Vegas helmet. He's just putting his balaclava on and he'll be making his way into the car and a uh, whole sort of procedure. Did you, when you were racing, Jonah, did you have a set routine where you had to put one glove on first or was it you had to do things in a certain way? For me, I just stuck it all on. I couldn't care if I put one <laughs> glove on first. I had no superstitions like that. Yeah, I, I was the same. I, I think I always got in the car from the same side out of habit, but then there was one year where my can't move from the right hand side to the left hand side of the garage and then practicality meant oh I'll just get in it from the other side now and nothing happened nothing went wrong and then I lost my drive 10 races later so maybe that was the thing maybe that was it actually damn but no I, I tend to think superstitions some drivers are very superstitious athletes in general can have superstitions but the problem is sometimes you have circumstances when they're out of your control and you've just had to put your wrong glove on first or you've had to do something different I feel like it could be a weakness at that time. Yeah, I think so. I think so. But we've got our first car on track now, or the two cars on track now, as Oscar Piastri is the first to take onto the track. And then his teammate is followed closely behind. Oscar's on the hard tyre, so he's opted to, to run the hardest compound that we have available this weekend, the C3 tyre. And Lando, by the looks of it, is, is out on the medium. Yeah, so just the two McLarens out on circuit. We've got 57 minutes and 21 20 and 19 seconds left in the session. Andrew Benson, alongside us as ever. Can we draw a line under yesterday? Is this a, a new dawn, a new dusk? I think the uh, the theme for today would probably be having walked up and down the paddock for the last few hours talking to various senior people would be lessons learned and a sort of slightly larger sense of humility than might have been obvious at various points yesterday. Um, quite a few facts have come out about the incident, um, or the sequence of events, I should say, um, about the, the incidents that uh, brought the first practice session to a halt. There's been a couple of statements from Formula One this morning, um, uh, a lot of complaints from the fans who were locked out of the second session yesterday. Um, obviously, the difficulty for Formula One with that has been that most of the tickets, I'm told, are three-day tickets. So how do you compensate those people? But the people who were only on single-day tickets yesterday, now, I'm not saying whether this is a good thing or appropriate or whatever, but they've been offered a $200 voucher to spend at the Las Vegas Grand Prix merchandise store, um, which doesn't buy you a lot of merchandise, uh, so, Alice, does it? Your no. jacket that you're wearing costs $300, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I did not buy that jacket, by the way. <laughs> Four people go, you bought a jacket for $300, but yeah, it's not going to get you far. I sauntered through the Venetian Hotel earlier on, and I, was am I thought, you know, we've had this what some people are calling a debacle of a Friday. The fans weren't happy, they were booing as they were evicted from the circuit. And then I walked through, and the, the queue for the merchandise store was out the door. I was thinking, wow, they're all still buzzing for this. Is it because they all were given a, uh, a $200, $200 voucher and, and off they went then? Maybe, who knows? But I mean, I think that, you know, it was quite the day yesterday on a, on a whole host of different levels. Um, it's, it is absolutely true to say that not everybody in Formula One, in fact, most people I would say, is not especially enamored with the, the, the practicality and functional aspects of this race. Nobody's enjoying the timetable. I think everybody feels it should be a couple of days, a couple of hours earlier in the day. Um, the, the the fact that it's not a it's a night race, but you're not you're being just 
trying to adjust to a different time zone, unlike in Singapore, is causing lots of people problems. But big picture wise, you know, people are accepting that things do go wrong, um, uh, particularly at new tracks, um, that, um, that, you know, there's still a potentially spectacular show to come and that Formula One has pulled off quite the coup um, to get the, to get a Grand Prix in Las Vegas. The negatives are that the sort of the nakedness of the pursuit of money is more obvious here, I think, than perhaps anywhere else in Formula One, and not everybody's particularly comfortable with that. And some of the uh, the consequences of that uh, pursuit um, will be revisited next year. Um, so yeah, I think lessons learned and a bit more perspective. I, w I think I sensed this. This I was about to say this morning, Jolien, but of course it wasn't this Let's morning. Let's not get it into it time all over again. Uh, and speaking of being uncomfortable, Carlos Sainz, who's out there now uh, alongside nine other drivers, we've got both McLarens, both Mercedes, both Alfa Romeos, the two Ferraris, and the two Aston Martins. So half the field have taken to the track, and Sainz has had a little bit of a lock up and a run wide at the first corner, but it's emerged. He actually he had a broken seat after his crash. So not only was the power unit destroyed, the chassis, the monocoque destroyed, actually the seat was broken for Sainz. Yes, yeah. yeah, so um, a few things I discovered this morning. First of all was that Fernando Alonso had a very near miss with the, uh, the um, I was about to call it a manhole cover. It wasn't a cover. What happened was that there's a kind of cylinder, imagine a kind of bin shape, if you like, that's seated in the concrete. And that, the whole thing of that raised up and the FIA told me, uh, after I'd discovered that Alonso had uh, had a near miss with it, um, that the sequence of events was that actually it was Esteban Ocon who was the first person to hit it. This was, I mean, they, I asked a series of questions and they reviewed, the, the, the spokesman reviewed the video for me with the officials and went through the sequence of events. Ocon hit it first, um, then Sainz hit it harder um, after Alonso had missed it, and um, then Joe just missed it and then the, the yellow flag that we were discussing yesterday in practice um, what's that for that was for that was for the drain cover but it wasn't quite clear on the CCTV exactly what was going on on the track at that time and it was about 20 or 30 seconds before the red flag was shown at that point so the FIA spokesperson described it as a sort of normal sequence of events they didn't think that there, any, there was any particular delay um, uh, but uh, and then obviously that led to the long delay when they're having to make sure that all the drain covers weren't going to do the same thing. And in the end, we had a 90-minute session. Loads of laps, as I already mentioned, for everyone, including Sainz and Ocon, whose chassis were changed. They had to build up a new car at Alpine and Ferrari, and they managed to complete the session. Ferrari were very quick, so Charles Leclerc has been the pace man so far this weekend. On a weekend where Ferrari had high hopes as well, Leclerc was half a second quicker than his teammate. It was a Ferrari 1-2 yesterday. Alonso looked decent in the Aston Martin. The Red Bulls, of course, were there or thereabouts and had very good long runs, as you'd expect in 2023. And it was a little bit of a subdued performance yesterday from Mercedes and McLaren. But Sainz, he didn't know yesterday that he had a 10 place grid drop until he got out of the car. And that's the other thing that we've got today is Sainz. Ocon and Alpine can start afresh. They actually didn't lose any running. It's going to hurt them having to build up a new car. But Sainz has this 10 place grid drop, let's not forget. And that will hamper him and Ferrari. So he, uh, Carlos Sainz, was up, they were quite upset yesterday at Ferrari that they weren't allowed mitigation and to, um, to change the car and the engine without the grid penalty that you're talking about. I can tell you that Mercedes made it known to the officials that if they did wave that through without a penalty, they would immediately put in a protest. Um, they thought they would open, you know, basically it's a can of worms. If you start letting people off for this, that or the other, there's a number of countless occasions through a Grand Prix season where one car or another has been disadvantaged through no fault of their own, you know, someone driving into them or whatever, um, and then allowances of that kind aren't made, so that's why, uh, that's, you know, I think, when, if, I don't know whether the stewards were considering letting Sainz and Ferrari off without the penalty, but when it became clear that a protest was coming in from Mercedes, if they did, they decided not to. Yeah, I think it's harsh on Sainz, but you've hit the nail on the head, Andrew. It would just open a massive can of worms and this is a sport and you're looking for any sort of advantage within the rules obviously and teams just imagine like you said if someone crashes in into you and you you damage a part of your car you damage the, the power unit you're gonna say well it wasn't my fault you know someone from behind crashed into me so I should be exempt so yeah as much as I really feel for signs 
unfortunately I just think it just opens too much of a can of worms if, if they were to wave it through. It ends up just being a, a big dose of bad luck then for Carlos Sainz, the only non-Red Bull winner this year on a night race on a street circuit and he's got a lot of work to do this weekend. Rosanna, how's things looking in the pit lane? Quite busy, I have to say, Julian. Oscar Piastri in the McLaren just been wheeled back into his side of the garage. Lots of Flovis on the back of his car. So McLaren obviously testing a few things, which seems a little strange on the penultimate race weekend of the season, but they know what they're doing. I'm sure it's all part of the run plan. And then, of course, we've been talking about Esteban Ocon in the Alpine. But a lot of guests in the back of the Alpine garage this weekend. Of course, huge investment from celebrities around the world recently. So uh, I'm sure they're all here keen to see how the team gets on under the lights of Las Vegas and as I look across the pit lane it's a little bit quieter now no one going out down the pit lane but I can see obviously the fans in the grandstand a lot fuller than yesterday but still quite a lot of seats empty and we were sort of sold this dream weren't we that it was going to be a sellout event everyone was going to be here to watch it all unfold we've not raced here for 40 years or so but not that many people filling the grandstands and i know you've got a different vantage point from me is it busier where you are because there's definitely room for more on the start finish straight julian yeah looking across to the to the start finish straight as well from our commentary box position and is it's definitely there's some people in there which is great but there's some uh, probably i'd say 75 percent capacity it's only practice maybe for qualifying later on they're going to filter out of the casinos around here and so see what formula one is all about it's a, a very slow start to this practice session as well so the fans that are there still haven't seen a huge amount of action bottas is at the top of the time he's out there on a soft tire in the alfa romeo and he's ahead of charles leclerc and carlos Sainz. those three cars separated by just 16 thousandths of a second then it's hamilton russell and magnuson Joe has just done one flying lap in the Alfa Romeo. Uh, Piastri and Norris took to the track but haven't done a flyer. Ditto for Aston Martin drivers Stroll and Alonso. So it's a, it's a very tranquil start, other than the Ferraris, who were very happy yesterday. Leclerc looked hooked up from the start. He's looking hooked up right now on this latest lap as he flashes down the Las Vegas Strip, past Caesars Palace on his right-hand side, and he'll hit the brakes for the final proper corner at Turn 15, his teammate following him down as well. And uh, Leclerc looking very hooked up. Slipstreaming may be straight in play here for a Ferrari as well. I'm surprised how early they've gone out here. Yeah, they have uh, taken quite early as, as Charles Leclerc there was squirming on the brakes going down in, into Turn 14. But we actually saw a little bit of close action, didn't we, yesterday between Leclerc and Verstappen, who were racing side by side, just having a, a little check out of the, the toe as Charles Leclerc pops up into top spot half just over half a second really nearly six tenths clear of his teammate the sound you can hear now is kevin magnuson who was pulled out of ferrari's toe looks like you take the <laughs> down. yeah completely mark slade engineer to kevin magnuson there not happy with leclerc he's obviously watched it on the screens and uh, leclerc basically chopped across magnuson he was starting a flying lap and uh, Magnussen couldn't start one of his own on the next lap. But we're a couple of laps into this practice session, and I'm sure that'll be no long-term hunt done for, uh, for either of them. It's early days, isn't it? But it's interesting that those, those, those flying laps from the Ferraris that we got down to, there's done a few flying laps now, of course. Leclerc's advantage over Sainz, half a second, is exactly what it was yesterday, pretty much. And uh, just to remind everybody about the Azerbaijan Grand Prix, which is, uh, I think, Baku is probably one of, if, if not... Charles Leclerc's favourite circuit because that might be Monaco certainly one of the probably top two and he excels in street circuits eight tenths and five tenths were his margins over Sainz in the two qualifying sessions there and he was saying yesterday that he does really really like this circuit it's exactly what he wants long break big breaking zones short duration corners he loves getting close to the walls he did a great qualifying lap at Singapore a few years ago do you remember I think that was 2019 was it put it on pole there very sort of lurid almost Gilles Villeneuve style um, so he's looking he's looking in really good form so far this weekend this circuit it actually strikes me as very Baku-esque if Baku was a night race it would, it would look not dissimilar to this with the long straights trimmed out downforce uh, cooler temperatures as well there's a lot of Baku about this place uh, and just a lot more razzmatazz off the track and a lot more show but maybe we will get a similar show to what Baku has provided in the past as well Leclerc top of the times at the moment by half a second Magnussen finally gets a time on the board then and jumps up to third in the Haas 
who had an okay day in the hands of Nico Hulkenberg yesterday anyway, reverted to the older spec. Haas up in seventh place, Magnussen just outside of the top ten, still battling it out for championship positions further down. Some of the closest battles for championship positions are further down. The battle for seventh between Williams, Alpha Tauri, Alfa Romeo and Haas now propping up the order. This is the sound of Pierre Gasly. A lot of stars around in the Alpine garage. Also around Alpine is yourself, Alice Pat. <laughs> Have you spotted any this weekend? No, I haven't actually so far. Um, I popped up and did a bit for them in, in Paddock Club earlier and it was just starting to, to fill up. But uh, yeah, there's a across the whole paddock that everyone's trying to get a bit of the, of the celebrities coming in this weekend. Would any of the investors in, in the Alpine team, you've got Rory McIlroy, Anthony Joshua, Patrick Mahomes, uh, uh, Rob McElhenney, Ryle Reynolds as well. Would any of would you, would you be starstruck by any of them? Anyone that you particularly want? I guess Ryan Reynolds, because he's just he's just cool, isn't he? Esteban Ocon was quite starstruck by him as well, running yeah. Deadpool helmet that, that this Deadpool weekend. Deadpool helmet is, uh, if you haven't seen it, make sure you check it out. It is, it's pretty cool, you know, and there's quite a few drivers. I, actually, I don't think Gasly's got a special helmet. We, we had this discussion yesterday. I think he's decided, you know, everyone else is going to be doing one. Um, so I'm uh, not going to bother, as Jack doing, gets a bit of a pickle there with his, his, his headset trying to plug in the Formula 2 driver in reserve for, for Alpine. Anyone that would make you starstruck, Benson? You've spoken to uh, to Rory McIlroy and Anthony Joshua, wasn't it, in Austin? In Austin, I did, yeah. 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 Um, I feel there's going to be no you, one, there's you're literally no one is there. You can't really do starstruck That's... when you're a journalist. It, it doesn't really work. Do you know what I mean? I can't. You can't be talking to Anthony Joshua. No, but you're, answering... you're impressed by elite athletes, surely. Put, 100%, that's you, why I'm you doing like this job. Any athlete, yeah. who would you like to? Or person? Well, Michael Johnson walked past me in the paddock a minute ago. He, you know, he's he's right up there, isn't he? You know? Oh, starstruck um, Benson. Um, I mean, I did hear years ago it was Joni and Palmer. He was just. That's probably why he avoided <laughs> me so much. <laughs> Do you know what? Funny didn't thing, want to get nervous, did you, Andrew? Funny thing. So back in the day, this is sort of seventies and early eighties. Alan Henry, who was a quite well-known journalist uh, in Formula One back then, he used to be frightened to talk to Gilles Villeneuve because he was so in awe of him. Um, which was, was lucky for him, Nigel Roebuck, is probably his best friend. Was best friends with Gilles Villeneuve, so he got all his quotes anyway. But um, now I, I wouldn't say in awe of, but I mean, obviously, you know. And you go out, there's people, aren't there, that you would you would certainly be impressed and it would be a cool thing to do to meet them, you know, like Robert De Niro, for example. Yeah. Um, so, of course, but you, you, you can't allow yourself to be awestruck in my job when you're talking to people like that. Cut through it, ever the professional. Speaking of Gilles Villeneuve, Jacques Villeneuve, married. That married one. yesterday. Yeah. In, in the, the paddock. In the, in the paddock chapel. I think probably the first and only wedding that's taken place in the F1 paddock, Jacques Villeneuve. Apparently he was surprised. Champ. He didn't know when he arrived here he was going to get married and his no wife-to-be basically said, you're getting married. Chuck on this three-piece suit. Yes. We're, we're <laughs> heading down to yeah. the marquee in the bottom and of we, the paddock. We know how much Jacques Villeneuve likes to wear three-piece suits as well, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there we go. Jacques Villeneuve married in Las Vegas this weekend. Sterling, you've got your girlfriend here this weekend. I think that'll be... Be a good uh, idea, no? You know, 300 weddings a day in Las Vegas. Amazing well, number. You could be one of them. I'm not about <laughs> in to the be paddock. one of them. I am not about to be one of them. Move it on, move it on. Nico Hulkenberg coming through the final corner and gets a time on the board. We've got a few more cars out on circuit. 16, in fact, out on track. Still waiting for Verstappen. Still waiting for the two Williams. And Joe has returned to the pit. So only one lap on the board for, uh, for Joe in 14th place. Loads more drivers out on circuit, trying to get some laps in now with 41 minutes left on the clock. This is the sound of Kevin Magnussen decelerating, slowing through turn seven. Left-hander around through turn eight, and there in comes Charles Leclerc from off the road, and that was super tight. Oh, Magnussen has a little look up in towards turn nine to try and fight back. Is this afters, after the first incident? It looks like it, doesn't it? So this was, we heard Mark oh. Slade. So we heard Mark Slade on the radio saying that Leclerc was taking the lead. This is now, a, what, five minutes later, yeah. and they've reached each other on track again. Magnussen was on a slow lap. Leclerc was on a faster lap. Magnussen stayed on the racing line. As uh, so Mag Magnussen's made a mistake, then spun the car around, and I guess Leclerc was on a build lap or a fast lap, and he came round the corner and 
Magnussen sort of poodling along in the middle of the road. So. Well, well, I noticed that the two Ferrari drivers were on a fast lap at the same time as each other, or not at the same, not in the same position. And Leclerc abandoned his lap just after sector one. Was that exactly that position on the track? Yeah, because the yellow flag was in sector one. Yeah, so. and now Leclerc's gone again. Looks like he's going to go fastest again. Yeah, so Sainz is at the top now, half a second clear of Leclerc. Leclerc trying to improve, and as you said, Andrew, has done actually the fastest first and middle sector on this lap. So now he's found a bit of Magnussen free air. He's able to come down towards the final corner, facing the MGM Grand on the outside. He comes through the left-hander, gets on the gas again and uh, Charles Leclerc will try and reclaim the top spot that has been pretty much exclusively his when we've been driving so far this weekend. We've got the Red Bull of Sergio Perez on a flying lap as well now, so Perez has graced the circuit. Still no sign of Verstappen or Albon. Logan Sargent has made it 18 cars now to take the track. Perez sweeping through turn 12, Leclerc sweeping through the final corner and go back to the top of the times, but only now by a couple of hundred. So Leclerc from Sainz Esteban Ocon in the Alpine up in third, then it's Alonso, Stroll, Gasly, Norris in seventh, Magnussen, Hulkenberg and Piastri, the top ten. Outside of the top ten, Bottas, Hamilton, Russell, Joe and Ricardo with times on the board. So we've got Sergio Perez now, who is on the soft tyre. The two Ferraris have set pretty decent time, must be said, on the, on the medium tyre. So let's see where Sergio Perez pops up. He's currently down in, in 16th place. Alonso jumps up the order, order sorry, also on a medium tyre, but a good seven tenths off the two Ferraris. And Perez, on the soft tyre, comes across the line, Jolian, and only goes in fifth place because he's just been jumped by uh, Pierre Gasly in the Alpine, who's also on the soft tyre. And Perez is, isn't it, eight tenths off on the soft compared to Ferrari on the medium? I'm going to ask you two a question now. But it's just occurred to me, you get... There are, you, people think of driver's tracks as Suzuka and Spa and Silverstone and things like that. But often you get the biggest gaps between teammates on circuits a bit like this. So Sainz and Leclerc in Baku this year, for example. Lewis Hamilton's always been amazing in Canada compared to his teammates. Alonso in Singapore is often way ahead of his teammates. And yet they're all circuits with what most people who don't know much about Formula One or motor racing would say, well, they're all slow corners, I can't be that challenging. Why is that? Is, is, I mean, it's got to be street circuits, isn't it? It's having the proximity of the barriers right on the outside of every corner. And they, it is pretty much that around this circuit. 6.2 kilometres, 17 corners. And there's a few runoff areas that were very much exploited by the drivers yesterday. A lot of lockups, particularly down at turn 12. But you, you've got to run as close to the barriers as you can on entry and on exit. You've got to be precise with your apex curves. And I think getting brave and maximizing that rewards you with a lot more lap time and i think also reading the track as well the street circuits the track evolution is, is so great so especially adapting from session to session and i'm talking mainly about qualifying now is a is a, a big thing as well making sure that you you adapt because like, this strip's been open you know through that's why we had the issue with having to finish before 4 a.m yesterday this strip's been opened cars have been going around monaco's the same and you know cars normal road cars they drop fluid you've had people walking across the the, the track as well the track evolves and it's about also adapting uh, with the circuit evolution as well the margin for error on street circuits is just not there you've got to build up you can't push and be a hero too soon or you can drop it into the barriers and lose a load of track time but you can't be too slow to build up, or you just will never get there because it's all evolving, as you say, Alice. Max Verstappen is on a flying lap, coming through to the final corner now. We've had a couple of yellow flags out. Bottas has been off in the runoff area at turn 14. He's got going again. We had Magnussen through the, uh, the runoff area at turn five earlier on. We've got a yellow flag out right now, but it is cleared. I'm not sure who's been off at turn five this time. This is the sound of Max Verstappen coming through the final corner, flat out left-hander, up towards 200 miles per hour and Verstappen goes up to third position on the soft tyres in the Red Bull, the two Ferraris at the top on the mediums, and Valtteri Bottas was the source of uh, the yellow flag. Now, that's, that was his original one. Lovely Scandinavian flick from Bottas, doing almost a full 360, doing donuts for the fans down at Turn 14. Yeah, he was, and it's not the first time I said Leclerc had... Well, he's, he managed to, to, to get out of it, but Leclerc was squirming on the brakes going into 14 as well and uh, Bottas just got a little bit out of shape rear locking but it's actually Sargent that went off at, at turn five 
and continued and I said it yesterday but I think this is going to be interesting to see going down into 14 and 12 you know those long straights get yeah, when the tires start to degrade in, in the race you know you could gain a handful of places with someone going going off there or you could certainly lose a handful of places so that's going to be uh, a tricky one for the drivers to try and deal with going into those tricky braking zones. Yeah, it certainly has been where the yellow flags have all been coming out. Turn 5, end of the first sector. Turn 12, which separates two very long straights of uh, Sands Avenue and the Strip, two kilometres long. And then there's a big braking zone as well at Turn 14. That has been where the action has been happening uh, and where the yellow flags have come out. But so far, Sykes has clouded the water valve, but no one has hit a barrier. And uh, I'm surprised by that. The grip level actually looks like it's coming up quite well. We've got plenty of cars on track, but Rosanna, we haven't got any Aston Martins on track at the moment. You're right, Julian. Lance Stroll has just come in. A, a lap or so ago, he came in and as he left the pits, he laid down the most incredible tread marks. It was a little bit scary. Quite a big squeal as the car slithered out into the fast lane in the pit lane. He's now back in the garage, but his teammate Fernando Alonso has been in here for a little while. The car up on the jacks and the mechanics looking at something underneath. Looks like they've solved what was going on there uh, because they are just waiting, I think, to send him out into the fray. And you might, if you're watching the telly at the same time as listening to us on the radio you might have seen the famous Rolling Stones logo on the headrests of the drivers in Aston Martin this weekend that's because they're collaborating with the Rolling Stones this week here in Las Vegas and apparently it's because there's going to be an exciting North American announcement from the Stones very soon so if you're a fan of that uh, you want to keep your eyes and ears uh, alert to any announcements coming out of Aston Martin soon lots of announcements at the moment they seem to be partnering with everyone don't they Andrew Benson uh, Aston Martin. Aston yeah. Martin. Yes, they, uh, sorry, just a couple of emails came in, which I need to look at in a minute, Rosanna, before <laughs> I, when I finished talking. <laughs> thought you were um, Googling the Rolling Stones to yeah, see what was coming out of there. They announced a new investment, but unlike Alpine, they wouldn't tell me, or anyone else for that matter, how much money it was worth, and therefore, or how much the shareholding was, and therefore how much the team was worth, which I was a bit annoyed about, frankly. Uh, but there you are. <laughs> there have been reports that it's a billion pounds, the valuation on Make, Aston Martin. I mean, it makes sense because Alpine was valued at, was it $900 million with their invest with the investment from that bunch? It took that us included... about £750 million, pounds, I think. Yes, Alpine. that's right. Yeah, £750 million. Pounds, so it would make sense that Aston Martin, which is a much more iconic brand than... Um, then Aston, sorry, Aston Martin is a much more iconic brand than Alpine. It makes sense if they were worth more money than, than Alpine. There, but I haven't heard, had any official confirmation that that's actually the real number. There is quite scant information, isn't there, about the Aston Martin, the, the sale of a shareholding that has gone on. Lawrence Stroll is uh, the man in charge there. Lance Stroll still occupying a seat. And one wonders, he's been very down in the dumps, Lance Stroll. He had a, a decent run out last time in Brazil, out qualified Fernando Alonso, got up into the top three in qualifying but he's been uh, having a pretty rough time of it. One wonders if some of that mood might have been because of changes behind the scenes, and then there's a, a change of shareholding at Aston Martin as well. I, I don't know. I mean, all I can say is that from a sort of outside perspective, if they're not going to tell me what the investment is worth, I'm not going to write about it. Simple as that. <laughs> you know? you tell it, otherwise, that? it's just a sponsorship investment, isn't it, which the BBC doesn't do. So um, there you go. All right, I'm going to read these emails now. Oh, we'll wait with bated breath for more Benson information coming up. We've got 31 minutes and 40, 39 and 38 seconds to wait before we'll have some Benson news, I hope, as Fernando Alonso is on the track now in the Aston Martin and uh, is hurtling his way down towards the MSG Sphere, down towards Turn 5, long straight down Coval Lane, hits the brakes from 180 miles per hour, 800 metres of straight. Now he's in the twisty stuff through the right-hander, through the quick left-hander at turn six, breaking and turning into turn seven, and we're in the fiddly stuff now, round the sphere, lit up in blue with some Fernando Alonso logos as he comes through as well. Don't think he'll be having a, much attention on that as he gets on the gas. Alonso currently in 10th position, had a decent day yesterday, up in third, and seems on, seems on, on better form at the moment, Alice. Yeah, he does. He seems to be enjoying this track is going to get a little bit of traffic in front of him though that does get out the way I'm sure that this looks like a Haas car that's moving out the way but he is one second down on Sergio Perez however Perez is on the soft tyre Alonso is still sticking to the medium tyre at the moment 
So Perez hit the top on his in his Red Bull on his soft tyres. Second flying lap for Perez. Verstappen is on a flyer as well as Alonso is on the mediums. Verstappen is going very quickly on the softs. In fact, he's the fastest man through the first and second sector, and he's about to close the lap. And he takes top spot away from his teammate. That's the fastest lap of the weekend from Max Verstappen, dipping into the one minute thirty fours for the first time. Verstappen top from Perez. The Red Bulls on the soft tyre. The Ferraris third and fourth on the medium tyre. Hulkenberg fifth on the medium tyre as well, having a great run in the down spec pass that he's opted for this time. Then it's Albon sixth. Alonso's just popped up to seventh in the mediums as well. Then it's Gasly, Sergeant Ocon on the soft tyres. Stroll on mediums is in 11th. Magnussen also on mediums is in 12th. Then it's Sonoda. The two McLarens, Norris and Piastri, 14th and 15th. Ricardo, Bottas, the two Mercedes, down in 18th and 19th on long runs for their first stint. 15 laps for Hamilton, 13th for Russell. They're both back in the pits. And Joe is 20th. I said we have 39 minutes to wait, 31 minutes to wait. Andrew Benson. So the two emails, one of them was very mundane. It was new exhausts for the two Alpine drivers. Oh. So we, we, can, we can save our bated breath on that one. The second one is not important, but it's quite interesting and indicative of the sort of surreal nature of this weekend. Qualifying and race are obviously meant to happen on different days in Formula One. Here's some radio. You okay? Yeah, yeah, all good. Logan Sargent continuing his scrappy weekend. Has just had an off down at turn 12, but just a little run wider. And he's fine. Go on, Andrew. But technically, because qualifying is at midnight tonight and the race is at 10 p.m. the next night, actually they both happen on Saturday. And so the stewards have had to put out a clarification about oh, this. Oh, here we go. Which says, for the purpose of reference to days in the Formula 1 sporting regulations, qualifying in the race will be considered to occur on different days as they would during a normal Formula 1 competition weekend. They found some extenuating circumstances for the weekend. Ferrari going to be thumbing through that rule book now, aren't they? It's uh, we've had Saturday Grand Prix before in the past, haven't we? Yeah, but Kyle qualifying Army. was on Friday on those ones. So. <laughs> yeah, Kyle Army '82, and I think both Las Vegas races, if I remember rightly, in '81 and '82, were also on a Saturday. Title deciders in '81 yeah. and '82. Yeah. No title decider this weekend. I'm sure Vegas had dreams that it might be, but that was long dashed by Verstappen and Red Bull this year. Clarifications going on. It seemed like they might have preempted that one a little bit more before we got to Friday for that. Yeah, you think they would have known about that before? They wouldn't need to put out document 35 at 8:30 on qualifying day. Oh anyway. dear! It must Actually, be a it's tough not qualifying job. day, is it? Actually, no, it is no, qualifying it is. day. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I'm totally lost with these time zones. Now qualifying day is tomorrow. That's the whole point. Ah, but it's not now. It's not. According to the stewards. To the ah, stewards. The yeah. sorry, the official qualifying day. Oh, technicalities. It's tough. 12 cars out on circuit. Plenty have come back into the pits after the first run. So it is the Mercedes and the McLarens. Still not showing their face. Norris and Piastri, 2.6 and 2.9 seconds down, have run a long run on the medium tyre. They said they weren't expecting a huge amount this weekend. Norris was 11th yesterday, Piastri 14th. They haven't graced the top 10 yet, and they're well down there as well. Mercedes as well not showing anything right now. 4.3 seconds and 5 seconds off Lewis, Hamilton and Russell. Yeah, Lewis Hamilton's done 15 laps though. So he's he's pretty much, he has done the most laps of anybody. But as you said, he's down there in 18th place on the medium tyre, 4.3 seconds off. So they're obviously doing race running, aren't they? Just on McLaren, um, they're not optimistic. And I think that I really mean that this time. You know, I know we've been uh, saying... The boy who cried <laughs> Exactly. They, they insisted to me again this morning. I was about to say this morning again, sorry, earlier this evening. They're, they're really not that... They don't think they're going to do that well here. However... Someone at McLaren did say they thought it might even be possible that they could win in Abu Dhabi. Oh, they're not showing a bit of confidence, uh, yeah, are they? They are. Wow, they're gonna they're gonna breeze it then, aren't they? After recent races of being doom and gloom and nearly winning, they think they might win. They're gonna be up the road. That's yeah, that'll be. It'll be nice to see someone have a challenge of uh, of Red Bull this weekend. We've got currently Verstappen and Perez top of the times, but we've got Ferrari looking like they pose a big threat at least in qualifying spec Mercedes said yesterday race pace will decide this one they said I mean you might think that's quite a normal thing to say in, in current Formula 1 with race pace being so crucial and that being Red Bull strength but it's a street circuit track position's always been crucial on this sort of event Mercedes clearly prioritising once again today some long run pace that looks like they've got 100 kilos of fuel in, in both cars and they're not worried yet on their, uh, on their qualifying pace 
degradation yesterday looked middling graining was the issue yesterday that's so cold temperatures bench basically is the problem there just on the overtaking thing hamilton said um there's not a lot of places to overtake because the grip is so low and the toe is not huge a bit like monza when you're behind people because you've got the small wing and there's not a lot of grip so he's actually saying well maybe even though it looks like there should be a lot of overtaking here maybe there won't be as many, much as people think that's interesting because i was told by uh fairly reliable sources and i don't know if you know more on this benny that actually they they've put some kind of chemical on the track this is before we had any running yesterday as we we're just seeing a replay of one of the williams getting ever so close to the wall that they've actually put a chemical on the circuit to make it grippier and when they were doing the track walk uh, the drivers or some of the drivers were walking around the track they were still laying this this chemical down uh, on the surface well, that's interesting, isn't it? But, and it may have been that the lack of grip yesterday was just dirt, you know, and then that'll get, that'll, uh, get better. Well, I guess we'll see after the end of today when the drivers start talking about it. I'm surprised how much grip there's been for a, often a newly resurfaced track. It's cool temperatures out there as well. Air temperatures just, just dipped underneath 17 degrees. It's, it's not freezing, but for Formula One terms, that's a, that's a chilly race. 18 degrees track temperature. So the grip level, considering that, has been decent. Every time we ever had a shot of Logan Sargent, who was the Williams getting very close to the barrier, he's either in the runoff area or he was perilously close to the barrier on that last occasion. But Sargent did improve as well on a soft tyre to go up to sixth. Uh, Rosanna McLaren, though, still down in 14th or 15th. Yeah, and some problems, Julian. Do you remember yesterday they said that Lando Norris's car had cooling issues and we were slightly perplexed because we thought, pretty cool conditions here. It's not like we're in a very hot desert. I know we are in a desert, but it's the night time. It's much cooler, 17 degrees or so. And here we are again, and Lando's in the garage. So is his teammate, Oscar Piastri. But Lando's car has um, got a lot of mechanics around it working very hard at the back of the car. They've got a leaf blower going through, or being blowing air through the air intake just above Lando's head. The front wing's come off. They've just taken the rear wing off. So that air's been blasted through the air intake and the carbon fiber, the bodywork, has been lifted off the roll hoop as well. So something is going on. I'm going to investigate uh, with the team to find out what, but uh, a bit weird to be taking the whole rear wing structure off uh, whilst trying to blast air through it. So uh, yeah, problems afoot potentially for Lando Norris and the McLaren. So strange. Fundamental issue going on then for McLaren. Norris yet to grace the top 10, the man that's been on the podium so many times recently. That's, uh, that's not going to be good going to Abu Dhabi if they've got, got calling issues, have they? But They must have closed up all the ducks for this, expecting it. Lando was actually saying a few races ago that they were going to have the surgical gloves, hand warmers and everything. If McLaren breaks for the Arctic and it's actually not too bad. The funny thing is that, you're right, everyone was talking about how cold it's going to be, five degree temperatures at night, but... I, Yesterday I was speaking to someone who lives in Las Vegas. He was the senior vice president of marketing at MGM, actually. He's been here for 15 years. And this was in the context of the Bellagio, which is where I was doing it. She said that they'd never been worried about the temperature at all. You know, and they were, this, is, this is someone who's organizing an outdoor, you know, corporate entertainment facility. Um, it does get cold in Las Vegas uh, in January, but she said this time of year they, she did, they never thought it was going to be as cold as people in Formula 1 were, going to say, were saying it was going to be. Is it is the classic case of doom mongering suddenly seeing something that might possibly be an eventuality, and uh, it is not. We had the extreme heat just before that as well, didn't we, in Qatar that no one saw coming, and then that was, and then everyone looked for the next weather source of potential jeopardy and it was this one but so far it's a pleasant temperature we got the door open to the commentary box and it's not too chilly no jacket for myself although we do have a slightly crazy air conditioning unit which every now and again blows hot air and then a bit later blows really cold air and i frown, turn around and frown at the producer when it happens <laughs> <laughs> even he's got his jacket on today so he must be feeling the cold ah, it's all right it's all right out there you're spending a lot of time in the bellagio this weekend andrew it was all one visit, Jolie, and uh, about 15 he's got, minutes he's long. He's got one of the hospitality packages for, for $12,000. Favourite view spot? Uh, it was amazing. But actually, I was speaking to Toto Wolf earlier. He'd, he'd heard that I'd been there. Um, word gets around, I did guess. He, he wanted a contact, did he? He didn't want the contact, but he said, have you seen ours? He said, you, want to, you should come and see ours. I can't remember what he called it, but it was one that they've got out the back of the paddock somewhere. He says it's amazing, and uh, we wouldn't normally show it to anybody who's not spending loads and loads of money there. But he said... Um, 
uh, I'll c- do you want to come and see ours? I was like, yeah, of course, yeah. Well, he said, well, I'll get someone to get in touch with you and um, the comms director, His actually. His people so. get in touch with your people. Yeah, exactly. And um, we'll take you over there between P3 and qualifying. I'm not, I'm not holding my breath for it because Toto is a bit notorious for making promises that he then doesn't deliver on because he gets too busy. But uh, anyway. Andrew Benson, tour of the hospitalities in Las Vegas. You're you're Viva you're Las Vegas. Do you know what? Blog about them. Joking. Well, I've got to write something after the race about the whole Las Vegas Grand Prix experience. But I think, just joking aside, I think one of the concerns, issues, whatever people have with this race is that the it's all about money, and I think. The fact that people have been giving the media tour of hospitality areas and one and not being shy of how much money it costs to be in them and no media centre in the pit building and all this kind of stuff, it's all just a continuation of this overriding message that it is all about money. And um, it's the nakedness of it is quite stark and uh, it is making some people quite uncomfortable this is a business after all uh, it's here to make money Formula 1 but um, it's, uh, it's definitely a factor to have in mind when you're covering the Las Vegas Grand Prix Russell jumps up to third in the Mercedes now they bolted on some soft tyres and Russell did the fastest third sector of anyone Hamilton up to seventh did you have one of the uh, the shoey shoey cocktails that are available at Bellagio $135 no, no food or drinks were available to anyone on the cocktail out of a leather shoe $135 bucks. Uh, no one offered it to me That's I'm not snip. saying I would have spent that money Steve Jones and Channel 4 were there as well by the way at the same time filming um, He'll be in, Steve would have been enjoying some cocktails actually I made, well. a, bit, I made a bit of a boo-boo because I didn't realise they were setting up for a big shot with Steve and everyone in the fans in the background and went up and pitched Steve on the bum and I was like I think I might have got in and ruined their shot but uh, anyway oh dear oh, causing havoc did, in the Bellagio you did with Andrew have Benson. one of those drinks didn't you you'd been on the shoeies 18 minutes and 20 seconds left 19 18 seconds left of this session it's gone quiet on track just the two mercedes then out and trying to improve joe in fact is out there as well in the alfa romeo and he's down in 17th place 2.7 seconds off on a set of softs trying to put something on the board for alfa romeo bottas has just left the pit so the two alfa romeos on a similar run plan to the two mercedes running some higher fuel getting their race preparation done Okay, so that's a P7 at the moment, uh, 1.3 to Verstappen. I expect to find uh, a lot on the second push. Pete Bonington to Lewis Hamilton. So Hamilton came through, set a 1 minute 36 0. Russell came through just seconds later and went nearly a second quicker than Hamilton. Hamilton's on a slow lap now, and bon- Pete Bonington there saying, expect to find more on a second push lap and that's what we've seen so far with both Verstappen and Perez on this soft tyre as well and that's interesting for qualifying isn't it because it's it's obviously indicative of the fact that they're struggling to get the tyres up to temperature they need a whole qualifying lap to begin to to then do it and then another treatment lap before the tyres are at their optimum you do sometimes get this on these on cooler temperatures street circuits it's a Baku special a preparation lap and then a, a push lap after that looks like for now two flying laps will be the one the Mercedes are out there and Hamilton is starting his second push lap Russell still in tow just coming through towards the uh, the commentary box that we're in and he flashes past us and starts a flying lap as well so we'll keep an eye on Mercedes times McLaren out there in the shape of Oscar Piastri Norris still no sign of him just 12 laps on the board and he's slipped down to 17th place and Piastri is coming down towards the final couple of corners as well hits the brakes at the MGM Grand turns it into the left-hander, clambers over the kerb, the Australian trying to get something on the board for McLaren, gets back on the gas, he's got 800 metres to go to the line now, there's a quick left-hander that brings you very abruptly to the finish line, he swings in the McLaren and comes through and jumps up to fifth place, Rosanna. Julian, I've got a question for you. As we were heading out here to Las Vegas, there was a lot of hypothesizing about what we may or may not see this weekend, how the track may perform. And a lot of people were talking about the teams trying to set up a toe to give one of their drivers a better chance of making it further up the grid. We haven't seen so much of that being choreographed as yet in preparation for qualifying. Is it because it's actually not going to work so well around here? Because I was thinking perhaps Ferrari might want to try it, given Carlos Sainz has that 10-place grid penalty. Perhaps they could 
use Carlos to slingshot Charles Leclerc a little bit further up uh, and hopefully put him on pole come today, tomorrow, however you want to determine the day that qualifying takes place on. What are your thoughts on setting up a tour around this circuit from what you've seen? I think that will happen. We saw Ferrari, they went they went out right at the start of the session. They've done 18 laps for Leclerc, 17 for Sainz, just on the mediums. But they were looking like they were running line astern. The Mercedes had a little bit more space between them on the latest laps. Hamilton improved, jumped up to sixth. Russell did not improve. He backed off it in the, uh, in the final sector. But now he does jump up and goes to the top of the times. No slipstream involved, though, for the two Mercedes, as Russell, he's uh, now fastest in the middle sector, showing a bit of pace. Sargent jumping up in the Williams as well. Slipstreaming, Alice, you reckon? Yeah, I mean, I've, it's worked before, but I haven't necessarily seen it. I know we saw it earlier on in the year. It wasn't um, in Mexico. Uh, Daniel Ricciardo and uh, Yuki Tsunoda were, were teaming up to, to help one another as... Uh, sound you can hear is George Russell making sure he's getting out of the way but no if, and I think you're, you're right Jolin that if Sainz has got that penalty he can certainly help uh, down this 1.7 kilometre straight which is stretches between turn 12 down to turn 14 he could get even if it gains him just a few tenths that's a big big chunk of time yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. They, Ferrari is a no-brainer to try and do that with Sainz. He's going to have to get into Q3 to, uh, to do that, but he's still got an incentive to go through because it's a 10-place grid penalty for Carlos Sainz. But he's, he's still got his own incentive to qualify fastest qualifier, hasn't he? It's not a complete write-off for him, unlike Sonoda in Mexico, who was consigned to the back of the grid. If Sainz qualifies on pole, the fastest qualifier, he'll start in 11th. And then you're looking at the points, whereas if you're just messing around trying to help your teammate, you could be down in 18th and then it's uh, it's a long way to get back. And I think also, which might make it a little bit difficult to try and do um, for the teams, is if we're finding that your second push lap is, is quicker just because of the temperature of the tyres and, and the evolution of the circuit, then who has to sacrifice at what point during the qualifiers? Because they can't both be on a flyer and give each other a toe at the same, same time. It's just not going to work so that can then come in between inter-team sort of battles well can't I go first or can't I go second so we'll we'll see I'll be, I mean Ferrari they they can because they've got a driver that's going to be taking a penalty but as you said Sainz is still going to want to qualify on pole isn't he yeah it's the source of many teammate heated discussions of the past some rivalries born out of that as well between the Mercedes duo Hamilton and Rosberg whether who would be slipstreaming who. I remember Ricardo and Verstappen having the same quandary at uh, Austria in, uh, in 2018 and having a bit of a fallout about it. It could be worth a good couple of tenths if you get a slipstream right. And that's going to be a little bit of a discussion heading into qualifying. So far then, Russell at the top of the times didn't have a slipstream, but uh, managed to sneak top spot away from Max Verstappen. The track's getting better, and Alex Albon has proved that by jumping into third place as well. Alonso's jumped up to fourth. Everyone now on the soft tyres, apart from the two Ferraris, it's Perez in fifth, ahead of Bottas, Sargent, Magnussen, Piastri and Hamilton now down in tenth. Big lockup still for Joe, who's just flat spotted a set of soft tyres that he was out there trying to improve on. He's in 13th behind the two Ferraris. And then it's Hulkenberg, Sonoda, Gasly, Ocon, Stroll. Norris is on the track now in 19th and Daniel Ricciardo, the shoey man, is uh, in 20th propping up the, uh, the order at the moment, starting a flying lap on the softs. We've got 11 minutes and 54 seconds to go. Alice, Max Verstappen, starting a flying lap. Talk us around. Yeah, so just, we're riding on board with him, which is absolutely perfect. I think best it out, he's getting a few small corrections there through turn one into turn two. On the exit of turn two for the racing is where the DRS detection and then DRS wide open from four all the way down to five. He stands on the brake around about 150 metres, just kisses the inside curb and gets ever so close. And he's actually up sector one, two and a, ten, two and a half tenths up on George Russell and then through six, seven, eight and nine and he starts that tricky trek all the way up to turn 12 now where we've seen so many drivers have a lock up, you know that, and we're riding back on board with him, that unweighted wheel, that left front wheel as he's just coming through a little bit of traffic there on the inside and he's locked up. He's made a mistake and gone straight on. He's going to spin the car around, Jolian. I think what he saw 
was Daniel Ricciardo pointing the wrong way in that runoff area. So Verstappen came through to turn 12 and then caught himself out by seeing a blue flag, a car going slowly on the inside. And then I'm pretty sure it was Daniel Ricciardo off at turn 12 pointing the wrong way as Verstappen was herring in. So Verstappen was on a very fast lap, had done the fastest first sector, but had to back off. Fastest middle sector went to Oscar Piastri and he's closed out the lap to go top of the times. Piastri ahead of Russell, ahead of Logan Sargent in the Williams, just one and a half tenths down, finding a bit of pace as well. The track obviously coming alive, but Verstappen there not able to take advantage. And that's that's one thing that's going to be crucial later on today, isn't it? The track's going to be the okay, we don't get any rain or anything. The track's going to be the best at the very end of the session once everyone's been round and round and round and, and cleared the trap and it's all dialed in it's going to be fastest and if like Max Verstappen for example makes that mistake and has a lock up and goes off that's it you know game over if you've lost that lap because the, the track's going to evolve and the times like I said Oscar Piastri they've been nowhere and all of a sudden they're getting that lap in and now looking at the timing screen so many greens getting dotted around and coming up uh, but also quite a few yellow flags had another yellow flag around turn six as someone's going wide but Lando Norris he's got soft tyres on now as he's going to try and make his way up the order from 19th place one more corner to go for Lando Norris was ahead of Alex Albon when Albon was the latest driver to go off at turn five bringing out the yellow flag and that is now clear. So more drivers going through the runoff area. Ricardo, Verstappen, Albon all doing it in quick succession. Here's Lando Norris exiting with the MGM Grand on his right-hand side up towards Harmon Avenue. And our commentary box at the final corner. And Lando will get a time in on the soft tyres. His teammates top of the times. Norris comes through and is six tenths down in ninth position. But playing a little bit of catch-up. And as we've seen, the tyres improve with the second lap thus far. Proven by Russell Sargent. Nick Piastri as well at the top. And we will wait for the Ferraris now on a flying lap. Haven't done a lap on the softs, they're on them right now, Leclerc and Sainz, but I don't think they're pushing on this first one. No, we're riding on board now. The sound you can hear is Lewis Hamilton. As he ekes it through, he's got a little bit of traffic that he just manages to get around. He's sitting in 12th place at the moment. Comes through into turn 12. Let's see if he can get it stopped and turned just about. Nice job. Understeering quite a lot. Caesar's Palace lit up on his left-hand side now as he comes up towards the final big braking zone. Lewis Hamilton currently slipped down to 12th position. Needs to find a little bit of time with eight minutes left of the session. Improving in the first sector, improving in the second sector. Sweeps around Carlos Sainz, who's on a preparation lap in his Ferrari, ready to respond to the improved times of pretty much everyone else out there at the moment. This is the sound of Lewis Hamilton then. Coming through turn 16, flat out now, 800 metres to the line, past Planet Hollywood, past more of the vast hotels that line this circuit, and Hamilton improves, goes up to seventh place. He's three and a half tenths down, seventh place. Times are very, very close. One minute 34.5 is the benchmark, or 0.491 for Oscar Piastri. Russell within a tenth, within two tenths is Sargent and Verstappen, and Hulkenberg now improves as well in the house, up to 12, six tenths down. But we've got 12 cars within just basically six tenths. Very, that, very close. And that makes it even more important, doesn't it, to make sure that you get every single corner absolutely nailed. If we miss your apex and lose half a tenth, that could be, for example, if we're looking at the top three, four, five positions, that could be two, three positions at that half a tenth of a second as George Russell now not set a personal best in the first sector but has set a pretty decent and fastest overall last sector and he jumps up again to the top of the times four tenths clear of Oscar Piastri. One minute 34.093 we're inching our way to the one minute 33 <laughs> that marker will surely be smashed through before this session is done with six and a half minutes left on the clock Russell very quick the fastest of anyone in the middle sector Logan Sargent's lap is extremely good actually in the Williams up there in third so I'll take the shine off that he's got the fastest final sector of all and we've got a Williams with a tyre bouncing across the track and it's Alex Albert whose left rear has detached from his car and he's coming down the uh, the Las Vegas strip he so he actually went off um, off track and continued at turn five so I don't know if he's got a a puncture or is that the car because it was actually the wheel that's been been ripped off look at look, look the tire initially for uh, for alban he's he's that's down at turn five but he's managed to uh, to carry on and alban is 
retreating the Williams back towards the pits. So he's driving it on three wheels at the moment. The session is still on the green flag. There's a very, very slow Williams. This is what happened there. So he turns it into turn five. Oh, he's going to hit the wall. There we go. Big whack of the wall. The first one we've had so far this weekend. And he just got in a little bit deep, didn't commit to the outside and the runoff area, turned it in, got stuck in between two mines. The box, damage. Three left, punch it. And it was a, it was a big hit. That's a big clout of the wall. And he's actually lucky that... Uh, that that front left didn't cave in as yeah there you go and who's that behind coming around that's Max Verstappen doing a good job of uh, avoiding the carcass of the tyre then followed by Lewis Hamilton Marshalls frantically waving the double yellow flags which means you suddenly have got heavily reduced racing speed and that'll be annoying for for the Ferraris because we still have the yellow flag so no red flag at the moment and just as I say that, out comes the red flag. But Charles Leclerc had just set the fastest middle sector of anybody. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see where he was going to pop up on the on the timing page. That will almost certainly be that for the session then, with four and a half minutes left on the clock. Albin has parked the Williams down at the final corner. He didn't manage to limp his way all the way back. He got down the, uh, the strip, but it's two kilometres. It's a long straight to do on three wheels and that is red flag confirmation session will not be resumed so as you say Alice nothing on the board for the Ferraris the team that looked to be in charge on one lap pace down in 16th and 17th without a proper run on the softs Science we know has the 10 place grid penalty as well the MSG sphere illuminates in deep red as well for the red flag and uh, that is the end of practice here and Albert's the tyre actually parked itself up really neatly on the outside when it did detach on the exit of turn 12 right up against the wall in a very safe space I don't think the yellow flag even came out for it but now we've got a stricken Williams we have an entire stoppage so the end order in practice is Russell Piastri Sergeant third place brilliant run from him and ahead of his teammate who crashed and ended this session prematurely this is another sound of a little whack left front and left rear for Albon the puncture the tyre coming down and then detaching from his car but Sargent ended up in third Verstappen fourth Perez fifth Albon with his crash still ended up in the top six good run for Williams straight line speed clearly a benefit for them right now Alonso seventh Hamilton struggling a little bit more down in eighth ahead of Bottas and Magnussen Norris eleventh Hulkenberg twelfth Stroll 13th then it's Ocon Joe Leclerc signs Sonoda Gasly and Ricardo. Thank you very much, Jolian. So yes, George Russell topping the timings, uh, unable to get to the full 60 minutes of FP3, but still uh, a fair few laps run by everyone. The sound of uh, the car passing me there, that's Lance, Lance Stroll and the Aston Martin coming into the pit box. And I've got uh, Yuki Sonoda as well, making his way back to the garage. Uh, I was listening into Lewis Hamilton's radio just before the red flag was flown, and he was asking his engineer, where am I down? He seems a bit lost on this track, uh, especially with his teammates right up there. Time enough to, to write things before we get into qualifying, do you think, for the drivers who are perhaps struggling at this point? It, that's tricky for Hamilton. He's a long way away from George Russell. Seven tenths, seven and a half tenths away from Russell. And that was over two flying laps as well. He was eight tenths away. Pete Bonington said, you can improve on the second one. He did. So did his teammate, and Russell tops the session. Yeah, he does. He's actually biggest losses to, to George Russell. So it's just under three tenths in the first sector. And then in the middle one, Lewis with a one with a 31.6 and George Russell with a 31.2. So uh, a good chunk of time there in the middle sector, and he's near enough the, the same in the last sector. So it's those first two two sectors, Rosanna. Yeah, it's going to be a, an interesting one to see where all these teammates shake out. And you were bringing up an interesting point earlier, Andrew, about how sometimes these tracks, especially the street tracks uh, like we're racing on here in Las Vegas, really separate teammates. And it is definitely doing that when it comes to the Mercedes. Uh, a difficult session for Lando Norris as well, finishing just outside the top 10 with what seemed to be some issues, perhaps with cooling again, whilst his teammate Oscar Piastri right up there in P2. We, we knew it might be a Ferrari track here, but we seem to always put McLaren and right up there now obviously since the, the second part of the season why is this track not suiting Lando do you think aside from the issues that he's facing well I wouldn't jump to too many conclusions just yet Rosanna I watched that lap that Norris did and he had a he was quite wobbly at turn 12 it, we, we lost some momentum coming out of that corner so I'm not surprised that he's down the field I don't think it necessarily I'm not saying I'm not giving a definitive judgment here I don't think it necessarily shows his true pace 
And I think that session generally with the stoppage four and a half minutes before the end, that's true of many drivers. Max Verstappen from fourth, for example, Charles Leclerc down in 16th, that's definitely not his true pace. Uh, Logan Sargent is not going to qualify third. So I think we, um, unless the world's turned upside down, which it kind of feels like it has in Las Vegas <laughs> in some ways. Um, so I think let's, I think there's a lot to come yet in qualifying. Well, that bodes well, Andrew. I feel pumped up and ready for qualifying. It's going to kick off here at midnight local time, which of course is eight o'clock in the UK. Hopefully you will join us then. A big thank you to Andrew Benson, who's going to go away and crunch the numbers, I'm sure, ahead of qualifying. Uh, thank you to Alice Powell and Jolian Palmer as well for talking us through that third and final practice session. As I say, qualifying gets underway at eight o'clock. Hopefully you'll join us then. This has been an IMG production for BBC Radio 5 Live.